Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Tuesday talks at the Atwood series. Uh, my name is Kevin Wright. I'm the executive director here at the Atwood Museum, and I'm very excited that you'll be spending the next uh, hour or so with us. A couple of housekeeping items before we introduce today's speaker. Our, our next lecture is scheduled for Tuesday, April 13th, with guest speaker Mike Thompson, uh, the man who uh, invented the digital camera. Please uh, mark your calendars and I hope you'll join us then. Uh, the Atwood Museum will officially open to the public on uh, Friday, May 7th. Uh, keep checking our website uh, for ex exact dates and times uh, as things will probably change off and on uh, during the next month or so. Uh, following tonight's lecture, uh, there will be uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom page. And one final note uh, about our lectures. Uh, one of the perks about being members uh, is free admission to our lectures. A lot of work goes uh, behind the scenes, goes into planning and securing quality speakers. If you enjoyed listening to our Tuesday talks, please consider donating to help keep these quality programs going. Ellie is gonna add a link to the chat if you are so inclined. And as always, your generosity is greatly appreciated. Now, without further ado, allow me to introduce our speaker. Ted Keon is the director of the Coastal Resources with the town of Chatham, uh, a position he has held since 1998. Mr. Keon is Chatham's primary contact regarding coastal processes and issues related to the marine and shoreline environment. He is directly responsible for the town's comprehensive dredging, shoreline change, and sediment management program. Prior to his position with Chatham, Mr. Keon was the chief of the coastal planning section of the Philadelphia District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. During his tenure with the Corps, Mr. Keon was actively involved in the planning and development of numerous shore protection, navigation, and other coastal related projects and activities along the coasts of New Jersey, Delaware, and Delaware Bay. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in physical geography, geography from the University of Delaware and Arizona State University. Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my privilege to introduce Mr. Ted Keon. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Sorry this has to be done remote, but at least there's technology to allow us to do it. So let me share my screen and get the presentation going. Oops. All right, so here we are at Chatham, elbow of Cape Cod. Um, as I'd like to say in many forums, the poster child of coastal change along this portion of the Eastern seaboard. It truly is a dynamic area and things that us residents, so to speak, of this area are very familiar with and have been dealing with these changes, particularly over the last few decades, uh, probably more than we actually wish we would, but uh, life on a sandbar, as they say. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit of sort of how we got here in a sense of the Cape and its uh, geologic history, if you will. Um, as I'm sure most folks know, Cape Cod is essentially a glacial remnant from the last round of glaciation that extended in the past uh, for a couple million years. Um, back then things were a lot different, uh, lots of ice on top of us, um, and the land masses were, were quite different. Um, George's Bank being a very important uh, facet to how the Cape ultimately developed and frankly is developing literally as we speak. So here's another picture. Um, again, the brown being the landmass Cape Cod and a bathymetry of the ocean showing that um, George's Bank was actually, or is actually much shallower than definitely the deep offshore as well as some of these other deep areas in the Gulf of Maine. Um, what's interesting is that, again, George's Bank in during the last glaciation was actually attached to the mainland and had lots of animals and critters roaming around. Then as the glaciation period, those millions of years um, kind of came to an end, particularly starting around that 11,000 or so 500 years ago, 
glaciers retreated, sea level rises, uh, or the ocean started to rise because the oceans were much lower back then. And ultimately, um, George's Bank became first an island and then it actually came submerged. The importance of that is that while it was sort of, you know, still there, if you will, um, it was blocking a lot of the deep ocean swell coming in from the southeast. So that the dominant wave direction during those, you know, thousands of years ago was really from the northeast. But as sea level rise um, was occurring and is occurring, frankly, uh, more and more energy was able to pass over um, Georgia's bank and really kind of giving the contemporary shape to Cape Cod as we know it. I'm going to run through another series of kind of showing the same sequence, if you will. These came from uh, Dr. Graham Geis, um, very prominent coastal geologist in the region. So here we are about 12,000 years ago with, at the time, the white line or black line with the white behind it was sort of the shoreline back then. Superimposed underneath, if you will, is sort of what the Cape looks like now. So you just focus in on this window here and then you start increasing in time. We're now 6,000 years ago, approximately. Sea level has increased from what it was, but it's still about 30 feet below from where it is presently. But you're starting to see that it's now actually taking a different form and shape due to this new you know, energy uh, wave action and just sea level rise in general. And then again, you step forward again. We're now just a thousand years later. We're still um, well below what current uh, levels, sea levels are, but things are changing. Uh, 3,700 years approximately, sea level is getting a little closer and we're really starting to sh have the Cape start to take the shape that we're familiar with. Again, 2,000, even more so. And then ultimately the shape that we know and love more or less today. So it really has been a uh, very dynamic uh, landmass in general um, that is, you know, feeling the effects of sea level rise and has been feeling the effects of sea level rise for thousands of years. So what we're dealing with at the scale currently um, pales in what has actually happened, you know, over the last few thousand years. Another way to look at sort of what this all means, again, the red here represents the original glacial deposits that were left by the glaciers. And the yellow represents those areas where new land has been formed essentially through the erosion and migration of sediments from essentially the red areas. And that, that's very important in how our beaches form and the barrier beaches in particular off of Chatham, Monomoy, these are all land masses that have been formed from the sediments originating from the original glacial deposits. We have some very dominant, of course, there are very smaller changes in, in, in local levels, but very dominant overall sedimentation um, and move, migration of sediments uh, on Cape Cod. Probably the most noticeable ones on the outer beach, um, beginning more or less in the East Ham or so area, Wellfleet and Truro is the migration of sediments from these banks up into the northern tip, basically forming the province lands. And then on the Cape Cod Bay side, you get a lot of northwest winds that then reshape the inner portion of Cape Cod Bay in a different pattern. And then in our region, if you will, we have a net south migration along the outer coast which is really the reason and cause for our outer beaches here um, and the Monomoy system. And then along Nantucket Sound, primarily from the very strong seasonal southwest winds, we get a dominant west to east migration of sediments as well. Kind of leaving Chatham here as the repository in many ways of sediments, although admittedly also because of a lot of physical structures, groins and jetties along the um, shoreline Nantucket Sound, a lot of that material is interrupted in this area. One of my favorite photos to really, you know, um, show how, again, this is all glacially deposited material and it's the erosion of this material 
that actually forms all of the beaches that we know and love on Cape Cod. If you didn't have this erosion process, there would be no beaches because the Cape has no other sources of sediment. Um, you go to the West Coast and other regions where you have uh, significant rivers that bring um, granular materials, material in general, down from the upper mountains through the rivers and deposits on the coast is the sediment source for lots of regions. Cape doesn't have that. Our sediment source is ourself, the, the land mass of Cape Cod. That same process is actually um, mimicked everywhere along the coastal banks internal um, to Cape Cod. Um, this is just a, a very small typical example that the little bit banks along the interior estuarine harbor systems, um, they also erode during storms or uh, not even necessarily storms depending on the site. And then that material comes out of the bank and then goes onto the beach to be redistributed by um, currents and wind and tides and waves and so forth. And it's really that process that has to happen for us to uh, develop the ecosystems and the resources that we all are familiar with and enjoy on the Cape. Um, this example, again, is just north of the cow yard um, after a small nor'easter we had. And here is that area just four months later showing how much that material then gets redistributed and then the ecosystem kind of attaches to it and creates uh, new resources. So again, the um, changes that we um, are now experiencing with our new breaks uh, is something that probably many of you, most of you perhaps on the, on the uh, lecture here are familiar with. This is not a new thing. Um, there is a well-documented cycle of the Nauset Barrier Beach system um, forming and then extending well down to the south toward Monomoy. And then with the right instances, um, you get new inlets. In 1846, the uh, inlet at the time formed just to the north of Minister's Point here. This photo or this uh, chart from 1893 is a little bit later. And then 1917, again, continued migration of these barrier beaches. This one looks you know, not that dissimilar to what we have now with a, an island between an inlet to the north and an inlet to the south. And then here it is as you know, welding onto the mainland. Another way to kind of show how this has happened without the charts is a very interesting series of photographs that um, my very go-to person for aerial photography, Spencer Kennard. He had flown as he does very frequently for me, giving me all these pretty pictures. He asked me to take a peek at the water just outside this shed that unfortunately has now been lost to erosion, right about there. And so I grabbed the particular date he was referring to and it was November 2010, he had just flown and here is this nice, very well formed uh, hull of a wooden shipwreck, um, approximately 40 to 50 feet in length. Uh, looking at the actual original photograph, you could pretty much see right into the bottom and some of the stone and ballast that was in there. It was very obvious that this ship had essentially sank in place for whatever reasons. It wasn't blown there from offshore. It, it, um, 90% sure sank right there. What's the significance of that? Is that, well, that photo was from 2010. Here is 2011. The color image is 2011. And the red outline is the beach, what it looked like in approximately 2006. So what? Well, that's where the shipwreck was, right underneath the whole barrier beach. So that wouldn't necessarily make sense. I mean, shipwrecks are all up and down Cape Cod. That's not a new thing, but you don't normally find shipwrecks underneath the beach. Well, when you then put that same position and show an older chart, you see that actually that wasn't a beach, you know, a hundred-ish years ago. It probably sank either going in or out of the inlet um, in the bars and the breaks and 
that was when there was no beach there. So just another very good instance of how these uh, barrier beaches migrate and that what you see now isn't anything like what it may have been um, before. So we move forward to uh, not that long ago. Many of you probably were around and, and were quite familiar with the Cape and Chatham in particular during this period. Nauset Beach had extended all the way down, you know, toward the Monomoy system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we were, you know, kind of ripe for what was about to happen, and that was a new inlet formation. Again, Dr. Geis had been modeling this um, event or this process and was, you know, I don't want to say warning necessarily, but acknowledging and and folks in Chatham that, you know, it was likely that a new inlet would form. At the time we thought it would form up um, near Minister's Point, but it actually formed right here. But during this period where the beach was well extended in front of Chatham, the inner shoreline was really quite calm, if you will. Um, yes, we had storms and things, you know, were always changing, but it sure was a quiescent period, if you will, for the inner harbor system. Um, the fishing fleet was able to get out. Admittedly, the bar was difficult, but you know, at least they were able to get out. But the internal channels and harbor system was pretty quiet. Well, that changed a lot. Um, here we are basically with the conditions now. We have a much different outer beach system, as we all know. Um, the series of changes since that 87 time frame are striking. Just to kind of document, in 1987, the first breach, um, recent breach that is, occurred just opposite the lighthouse. 2006, what was now the, you know, previous end of Nauset uh, uh, Beach, um, welded onto Monomoy, closed up the old inlet that used to be down there, closing out the Southway, which was a favorite uh, access for boaters that no longer exist. 2007 was the uh, the big surprise, if you will, because we really didn't think we were going to get a second inlet after the 87 break. We did. Um, and it's now, you know, pretty much dictating what's happening in the rest of the system. 2013 was the first break um, through the, again, remnant of South Beach. South Beach is now literally falling apart, not much left to it. And then in 2017, what had been the land mass or land attachment to mainland uh, at Lighthouse, you know, that broke through, which, um, well, happened on April 1 and has commonly been referred to it now as the fool's cut. So a lot of change over the last few decades and frankly, a lot of changes coming um, as well. To put that in perspective, this is kind of going to be a, um, it's a very neat uh, series of photographs through Google Earth. It's called Google Earth Engine, I think, or something that effect. But I'm going to click this button. It's going to run through basically the same image um, from 1984 to 2018. And my point being is if you were a coastal manager, say in this general Hyannis region of Nantucket Sound, you know, life was pretty boring. So here we are running through a sequences of years. Yes, there's a lot going on in the mainland with development, but there wasn't a whole lot going on along the shoreline. Yes, I'm sure if you sat on a certain beach, there would be changes that would be quite noticeable, but from this scale, not a lot going on. So now we're gonna go to our neck of the woods. Um, exactly the same time period. And I'm going to run, it'll run a little slower and I'm gonna run through two sequences, but a very different scenario as far as um, change in a dynamic system. So here we go. 1987 break, attach the mainland, South Beach coming down, connecting to Monomoy, boom. 2007, the break at the north. And we'll do it again so you can kind of watch it again. 
I mean, we've all sort of seen these changes subtly, but when you really watch in this sequence, you just see how much is actually moving out there, essentially on a daily basis that we don't really notice. So just a very impressive way of viewing how active these outer beaches are uh, along Chatham. So this is a poster I keep putting together as we get um, new imagery. We fly the coast um, every year and have since, frankly, the 1987 break uh, to document um, the changes, uh, both on the beach itself and the channel systems, because these changes are critical to both the navigation interests we have, which are significant with our fishing fleet, but also in just how things are developing and the impacts um, that they may have along the mainland. So drawing a more or less a straight line right through where the original uh, 07 break occurred, you see that very quickly afterwards, there was a substantial northern migration of the barrier beach. It then started to stabilize and started to grow back to the south as is predicted. And now you see that we've kind of come back to Minister's Point, more or less where it started, whereas the southern tip uh, I'm excuse, pardon me, the northern tip of the island has now peeled back. There's some very important things that did occur in this 2017 to 2018 timeframe. The outgoing waters of Pleasant Bay, pretty much, you know, even during these early phases of the inlet, still went to the south because it was so shoal inside the new inlet that the lower, you know, the tides couldn't go out the New Inlet very readily because of all the large shoals. But in June of 2017, and then the very strong, if we all recall, the um, storms of 2018, March in particular, a big change occurred. First, in that summer of 17, the tip of the um, North Beach Island basically severed. I'll show you another picture in a minute. And then that just obliterated over the next few months. And what you also see is a very sizable shoaling in the, what had been this main channel behind North Beach Island. And what happened and really important in the development of the North Inlet is that now became a very important artery for both incoming and outgoing tide. And the Southern Inlet started to kind of, what they call decouple if you will, from the North Inlet. And that's a sort of significant um, point or, or uh, period in the development of the Arrow Beach system. Now, when you look down to the south, um, starting approximately at Andrew Harding's Lane, a small pocket beach that was um, in tough shape following the 1987 break, uh, that's where we lost a number of homes during an initial few years following the 87 break when the changes were very rapid in this area and the shoaling up through um, Chatham Harbor really impacted the fishing fleet. But since the new inlet uh, occurred, a lot of changes now occurred at the southern end. Um, with the new inlet actually capturing much of the flow, the flow going in out of the south inlet was much different. And because of that, the southern tip of the island really started to extend further south because the currents weren't flushing the sediments out as they used to, you know, when it was the only inlet or the dominant inlet in the early phase of the two th after the 2007 break. And then also very dramatic, the changes to South Beach, where it basically has fallen apart and, you know, is almost non-existent in the present tense. It's interesting to see how <clears throat> these you know, changes along the outer beach um, correspond to very significant uh, changes and therefore on the inner side, on the mainland. Here we are back at Andrew Harding's Lane. Um, we were nourishing this area repeatedly with dredging in Chatham Harbor at the Fish Pier prior to the 07 break. Um, at least a half a dozen or more times of material, basically to try to maintain this area and not have it deteriorate to nothingness. And then after the 07 break, things really changed. Um, 
A, we didn't have the same dredging issues right at the fish pier at the time. And all of a sudden we saw a huge influx of sediment coming up from the south along the mainland and really has just completely naturally you know, reestablished this, this shoreline uh, in an area that had been very, very um, heavily eroded because the inlet, frankly, was right opposite it at the time. Now that the inlets moved further to south, the currents are much less. This area actually gained a lot of material um, through natural processes. At the northern end, however, uh, we're experiencing a similar rapid change, but sort of in the opposite in many ways. Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, Linnell Lane Beach, uh, just to the south side of Minister's Point, um, and in general, this whole portion of North Chatham. The issue here is um, really the change with the break off um, of the tip of North Beach Island um, and how it has impacted this, this North Chatham shoreline. In April, of 2017 and into May, um, we cleaned out the mooring basin at the fish pier and put some nice beautiful sand up here on this area um, referred to as the Nell Lane Beach to really kind of bolster it. The private homeowners had done a couple jobs with material they brought in by um, trucks, but we had an opportunity to put material there from the dredging, which was frankly better material and um, better quality uh, material in a larger volume. So we finished that project in uh, May of 2017. As I indicated earlier, during that summer, we had the small breach right here on the tip. There's another shot of it. And within months, that tip basically um, deteriorated and it was non-existent. And what that meant was we now had removed the, essentially the um, barrier, if you want to consider it, for wave energy coming in the North Inlet. And that immediately um, started to change the entire kind of shoreline and conditions along the North Chatham um, area. Uh, not necessarily for the better, frankly. So again, here we are, um, Linnell Lane, um, October of 17. Um, we were already starting to see migration of the sediments uh, early on. And then just jump forward to this past summer, and you can see a massive change over these last couple of years. Uh, we've had close to 200, well, actually over 200 foot of recession of the front beach, and then in a substantial migration of sediments all along um, this North Chatham area. Frankly, the volume well exceeds the amount that we put there, so there has been an input of additional material from all this wave energy that is now coming in. Uh, through the North Inlet. It's hard to really determine where all the sand is coming from, but it's coming from somewhere. Um, whether it's kind of taking it off the, the shore bottom here and, and pushing it up onto the shore, it's, it's not clear. But there's a lot of material moving. Another way to look at it, here we are at Cal Yard, um, the Cal Yard Landing, looking north again, December of 2017. Things were changing slightly now, or beginning to change. And here we are three years later. Every bit of that material was naturally migrating um, through the increase in wave energy coming in the new inlet. Um, the environment in here, the coastal environment, if you will, is much different. It has gone from sort of the interior uh, estuarine marshy system to right now because of you know, sediment in the system to, it, I don't wanna say it's an open beach environment, but it's a much more um, environment suited to a higher energy wave environment. Looking to the south end of the island, um, again, a lot going on this past year. Um, fortunately, we were, um, or there was a naturally maintained uh, navigation channel, the fishing fleet pretty much um, for the most part, except for some vessels at high tide, we're using the south um, inlet as the preferred navigation way. I hope that lasts for another year or so um, or longer, but you know, this inlet is 
going to change a lot over these next few years and how long it will serve as a navigation, a viable navigation way is, is frankly unclear. Um, hopefully the North Inlet will develop into a better navigable way and or the town is pursuing additional dredge permits for this area to hopefully um, provide navigation um, access if necessary. Another very um, interesting and challenging issue I think you could appreciate was the uh, marina, Outermost Harbor Marine located you know, just inside what is now the South Inlet had uh, admittedly very obviously some significant challenges over 2019 summer season where they basically had for almost all phases of tide, no, no viable access. Um, they underwent an extensive dredging project last winter. Here it is, um, establishing a new channel. And, you know, it's frankly been very successful. Um, they are directly opposite the inlet, more or less, but things have changed over this last year. Further extension of uh, the southern tip of North Beach Island um, has begun to shelter it. And I frankly did not expect that this channel would uh, last as uh, or held up as well as it has. Just kind of reviewing what they did last year during the winter, um, just about now, they were just wrapping up this time of year last year. They had a hydraulic cutter head dredge come in. It was a private contractor. They launched it right at the marina and basically had to cut its way out. They pumped the sand up onto what's referred to as the Quitnesset spit. Uh, prior to this uh, material going up there, the spit had retreated a lot. The beach used to be out here and it was getting forced back through erosion and overtopping and, and the sand was coming up and over the very low beach at the time and burying the marsh behind it. The new sand dune, if you want to consider it such, which it is, um, that they've placed there is definitely helping protect, you know, the overtopping and further burial of the marsh system behind it. And frankly, it's also protecting uh, what potentially could have been or may still be, we're still early in this system, some impacts to the Morris Island um, causeway. So that sand has been very helpful for protecting the Quitnesset, you know, marsh, marshy area. Um, what hasn't happened and is now, as I'm sure you've been reading in um, the newspapers, is the impacts along uh, the fish and wildlife property along Morris Island and the very steep bluff um, directly in front of their headquarters building and the weather service facility. I mean, there has been very significant bluff recession in this area because again, they are staring at the ocean and South Beach has essentially deteriorated and disappeared in front of them. So this is a legitimate and major issue for this area as far as you know the facility. Um, fish, or pardon me, the weather service does plan to remove uh, their weather station before you know, the erosion gets to that point. So the future for this area is, um, is dicey to say the least. This is another interesting way to sort of use some of the modeling results and studies that we've been doing sort of addressing these um, significant changes and understanding what's happening and, and helping us plan to some extent. The colors here um, is again related to depths, the purple being the deepest, the dark blue next, and the light blue the shallowest. So here we are directly opposite, or pardon me, um, at the time of the 07 break, and you see the very shoal um, area inside that new inlet at the time. And, you know, it's still very subsizable and significant channel running behind uh, North Beach. And then you compare that to, again, what I referred to is this kind of big shift in the 18 or 17 to 18 time frame, And you really see how that area has just shoaled in. And now you have a much better hydraulic connection between the inner channel and now out through this inlet. Um, another very you know, interesting aspect of this is how the progression of the shoaling on the inside 
um, of the inlet has narrowed these channels. When you have a lot of water flowing um, through a system, a channel system, and then you narrow it, what happens is obviously the velocity increases substantially. And we have had a substantial increase in velocities in this area to the point where there's actually been scouring um, at the base of Minister's Point. And you may have heard or seen in the reports that there was um, a partial collapse of one of the revetments right at the tip during those 2018 storms due to the increase in currents and scouring at that base. And then again, the shoaling here, which has just you know, allowed that um, channel to now migrate you know, more readily out the north inlet. When you look at this, this is a different color chart. This is now related to the speeds of those currents. So again, after the 2-7 opening um, up here, this is the ebb currents, the outgoing tides coming out of Pleasant Bay. <clears throat> Yes, when you got right to the inlet, there was some pretty fast currents. It definitely was you know, having water flow out, but still a very substantial amount going to the south and then running through the south inlet. Look at this now, the 2018. Substantial increase in current velocities right at the tip of Minister's Point and heading out um, to the ocean. Yes, we are still getting flow through Chatham Harbor, down going um, at the southern tip, but right at the Watch Hill, the other kind of narrow point back in that 07 timeframe was very, very strong currents. Now is almost nothing, very low currents. And then you compare that to the incoming, and again, a very substantial change. 2007, both inlets were feeding Pleasant Bay and Chatham Harbor with a lot of water. The North Inlet, because it's closer, probably feeding more, but there was still a lot of water coming in and running past Watch Hill. Now you compare that with the 2018 scenario, and particularly because of the separation of Lighthouse Beach with um, South Beach. Substantial increase in flow coming in from the North Inlet. Yes, you still have water coming in from the South Inlet, but very little going north. Just look at that at Watch Hill. And where's that water going? It's now going to Nantucket Sound. And this is all related to essentially the differences between the ocean and Nantucket Sound where the ocean is generally higher, not always, but mostly higher in elevation than Nantucket Sound. So, you have water flowing from the ocean to Nantucket Sound wherever it can, uh, and it has a new, a new way to get there. Another way to look at, this is a wonderful photo, um, 2015. We have the North Inlet up here, the South Inlet prior to the Fool's Break, the Fool's Inlet, if you will. So both inlets, you know, because I had nowhere to go in the South Inlet, were moving to the north and filling Chatham Harbor and Pleasant Bay. Now, as I indicated in earlier shots, um, South Beach has broken up and there definitely was a fair amount of water and sand migration um, through those breaks. But as you can see, it was very shoal. So yes, there was water coming in, but you know it was running into a lot of friction because it was very shallow. Compare that to now the more current conditions. Um, South Beach has separated uh, from Lighthouse Beach. So where's that water go? It comes right in that deep water channel right around Morris Island and is just pouring water through into um, what we call this area, the Morris Island Cut and into um, Nantucket Sound and from the very troubling scenario causing a lot of impacts to our stage um, harbor entrance channel, which is really the lifeblood in many ways um, to the maritime interests of Chatham. It's our primary deep water port, you know, well over 2000 moorings in this area. I mean, it's a very important artery. So this was 
more than a challenge to say the least these last couple of years. Um, here we are uh, a little over a year ago. Um, the shoaling had progressed completely across the entrance to Stage Harbor. The buoy systems, uh, you wouldn't want to use the buoys to find the best water at the time because there's the green buoy, there's the red buoy, the channel right between them, and you would have been high and dry. So that was obviously a very bad scenario. Fortunately, uh, the Corps of Engineers, even though they didn't originally have money in their budget to provide any dredging, they were able to get some emergency appropriation to help us out, if you will. So they came in in January and unfortunately didn't really dredge where they wanted to because we could not get the buoys out of the way. They were hoping to cut back this edge by running you know, basically where the green buoy is. But with the buoy in place, the tackle on the bottom, the dredge couldn't do that. So all they did was work around the shoal. Very helpful, but we knew that that was gonna be very short lived. The Currituck, um, the hopper dredge from the core, if you're not familiar with it, is um, relatively small given the type of hopper dredges in the, in the world's fleet, but it runs along, it drags two kind of vacuum cleaners on either side, little arms extend, extend down, fills the inside with a slurry of sand and water. The sand builds up, the water flows out, and then it moves to its prearranged disposal site, which in our case is right off Harding's Beach and the hull opens up and the sand dumps out and they go back and do it again. So that definitely, you know, bought us some time, but we were then uh, in the dire need of continuing to do it. So we were uh, fortunate that private contractor at Islamos was available and we contracted with them to bring their cutter head dredge with a pipeline, a booster placed in the midpoint of uh, Harding's Beach to the, the dredge by itself can't really pump it, you know, much further than where the booster pump is. So you need the booster pump to get it further where we want it, which is the public beach down at Harding's Beach. That project was quite successful. Um, it was able to cut through that shawl and it did a, you know, um, very important improvement to the Harding's Beach area. The red line is about where the high tide line was <clears throat> prior to the project. It was right up against uh, the dune system. And we were actually starting to see some minor undermining of the more Eastern parking lot you know, at that time. So conditions along the beach uh, were pretty tough. And then the blue line, you know, this is after the project, really shows how the, the two areas that we pumped in front of the, both parking lots, as well as a portion of the Harding Shores um, Association property uh, really helped those beaches for this past year, which were very well received by the public. That doesn't come cheap, however. Um, the federal project in January was fully federally funded because they had money. It is a federal project, um, but the project uh, with this private contractor was not. Um, this actually, believe it or not, was a cheap number considering uh, because the dredge was already in town and it just kind of jumped over next door to, to do our work. We got other estimates from other dredging contractors and they were well over a million dollars for exactly the same project. So this is not inexpensive work, particularly when you're working with um, private contractors. So even though we did that, this channel right here was the result of um, that private contractor doing the work. We knew that that still wasn't going to be good enough for the upcoming boating season. So for the first time, we uh, entered into a memorandum of agreement with the Corps, and we actually essentially hired them. They had no funding to, to really put to the project but they are able and, and have done in other locations, you know, entered into an agreement with the community where we would actually fund the project. And we did, and we bought two, 10 days worth of um, effort, but volume wise, it was very efficient. It was, you know, basically more than double what we were able to do with the um, private dredge because it's a very efficient way of, you know, moving the sand. 
unfortunately doesn't put the sand on the beach, which is really what our ultimate goal for using the sand would be. But nonetheless, um, we needed it. It bought us uh, basically, I think, the summer season. Um, and, you know, at expense of $360,000. Well, guess what? A year later, here we are again. Um, the shoaling, as we fully well knew, with the pressures have not um, reduced or, or stopped by any stretch. So now we have the county dredge. The county dredge was not available last year when we were trying you know, for this project. They were this year and they are literally working out there um, right now doing much the same as we did last year. Uh, difference this project, however, is that even though it's a similar cutter head dredge and pipeline booster pump in exactly the same location, we're now pumping the sand all the way to Cockle Cove, which is a, um, another you know, area very much in need of, of nourishment. And this is looking from the Cockle Cove area. Um, it's an 11,000 foot pump. Uh, that's a long way. Um, they have um, done this twice now. This is the second time. And in each case, this is the longest that the county has uh, ever pumped material. To help us in anticipation of doing this specific project and projects in the future, the town actually purchased 3,000 feet of additional dredge pipe so that this project could happen. Um, the county has 11,000 feet in its full inventory, but it's spread out all over the Cape um, on both sides. So they would never be able to really get all of the pipe for this project. So we offered to purchase 3,000 feet to supplement their um, inventory. And we will now you know, keep that um, pipe in Chatham in anticipation of doing it, quite frankly, probably next year. We put it here at the feeder beach, as I call it, which is actually west of the actual public beach. And the purpose here is to put the material here as a um, temporary storage, if you will, and a naturally eroding area. So once the material is placed here, the currents and waves will carry that sand in the easterly direction and naturally feed the beach. It's a much more um, stable, if you even want to consider that word in this environment, a way to maintain the beach, as opposed to just pumping it all up on the area in particular, and then having that big bump get knocked off by nature, which happens very quickly. So this is a much more efficient way to keep that beach fed, if you will, uh, through natural processes. Getting down to the end here, um, as I just sort of reviewed this challenge um, in the Stage Harbor entrance and this deterioration of you know, South Beach is a big deal. Um, as I just went through a very severe and not diminishing shoaling issue to maintain this critical uh, navigation artery. But not only that, we're also seeing um, some pretty strong erosion right at this corner of what we refer to as Crescent Beach because of these strong um, incoming tide, um, not, in, not only incoming, but primarily incoming tides uh, just forcing the, the currents up against the beach. Because of that, we submitted and were approved, um, awarded a contract uh, for this current year, which was, you know, we're, we're kind of right in the middle of it right now, trying to come up with, you know, what do we do about this? Other than just simply, you know, dredging incessantly, are there anything, um, other alternatives that we may be able to implement to deal with this probably not on a permanent basis because this system will change and conditions will change. We hope for the better at some point, but you know, what might we do in those interim numbers of years to sort of you know, reduce our shoaling impacts and erosion impacts? So the study, as I indicated, is, is very early on in its kind of numerical component. Um, we have um, this chart or, or, or plot is a numerical representation of the maximum. This is the maximum tides on the outgoing um, basis. As I indicated earlier, the ocean is usually higher 
the Nantucket Sound. So flow is very predominantly from the east to the west, but at a relatively narrow portion of the tide window, you do get some reverse flow, but it's, it's I don't wanna say negligible, but it's, it's minor in this area here. Yes, you got flow coming out of the South Inlet, but in this area, it's quite minor. And then you compare that to the incoming and it's very striking of how much water is coming both up down from the north in from um, the south inlet as well as through the breaks in south beach and just moving and pouring sand in front of it and unfortunately right into the stage harbor channel um, so again we don't really have any alternatives yet to kind of review with folks um, as far as you know how to deal with this whether we reach try to relocate the entrance channel in some fashion do something that could deflect currents underwater um, is an option uh, building sand dikes to try to deflect flow these are all you know potential options but again it's going to be a challenge to, to deal with this for the foreseeable future and with that i'm going to wrap up i believe and Thank you very much. I'll try to stop my screen sharing here. Thank you very much, Ted. Much appreciated. Uh, very informative information. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them uh, in our Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. Ellie will read them off to Mr. Keon and uh, we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, and uh, we'll see where we go from there. All right, go for it. I'll actually start with one um, that was sent in by Don Broderick, who is our uh, lecture chair here at the museum. Um, and he was asking if um, in sort of the near future, because um, obviously you were just speaking about how the stage harbor issues are kind of a, a long term project, but um, in the near future, do you foresee a need for dredging perhaps annually or biannually? Um, what is sort of- Yes, yes, and yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right now, <clears throat> really dredging is the only option we have. Um, there's nothing in the short term, meaning in the next year, two years, perhaps even three years, um, to do something differently. Now, if the outer beach, south beach, the shoaling drastically changes, which I wouldn't see it drastically changing to the benefit of our shoaling issue in that time frame, I, I, I think showing or dredging is really the only option we have to you know keep up with things um, ultimately if you recall some of those very early charts i saw at the or showed at the beginning of lecture south beach frankly north beach island is moving south and that material may weld on to the shore and we may once again have a monomoy north monomoy attached to morris island that would obviously help our shoaling issue, um, but it will also not be very attractive for the navigation interests who now would have to go around Tip of Monomoy again, like they used to. Gotcha. Um, I'll go with this next question. Um, somebody's asking about if there's any, if there are any options um, to help stabilize the bluff on Morris Island. I know it's, it's something that you've talked about a bit, um, how, yeah, there's right around well, the weather station. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, options, well, there's really two options. You either pump a lot of sand to the base to protect the toe and have that as sacrificial, um, or you try to harden, stabilize the bank itself. Um, it's federal property, fish and, fish and Wildlife has jurisdiction over it. They have indicated that, you know, hardening um, that bluff would not be within their interests. Um, very similar to what the National Seashore on the Outer Beach, you know, they don't they don't harden those bluffs of Truro and Wellfleet that I showed at the beginning of the of the lecture. They are allowed to erode to essentially provide the sediments for adjacent shorelines. Um, not that the erosion of those bluffs is going to solve the erosion issues by any stretch, but at this point, I'm not aware of any plans to do anything other than relocate. Um, structures and assets on top of the bank. Gotcha. I've got a question that a, a few people have actually asked um, in regards to the recent 
um, wash over that happened on, on North Beach. Um, it's something that yep. uh, sort of over this winter, for those of you who may not be um, local to the area, there's been a new, um, it's not being referred to as a break as best of my knowledge because it's not, um, it's just coming from one direction as opposed to both directions. But there's right. even, even right now, more change happening. No, you know, I, I, I could add about 50 more slides to my lectures, depending on <laughs> what topic we want to talk to. Um, absolutely, it's something we're watching. Um, it's absolutely something that we are not surprised with. It was a narrow portion of um, North Beach Island to begin with. Uh, I think everyone should recognize that what we refer to as North Beach Island is deteriorating. It's eroding, it's, it's the, the eastern face of it is already receded a lot. And I don't see and having, and, and nature is kind of proving this out so far, I don't see any real pressure for, as you indicated, Ellie, a return flow. Um, not having a dune system out there definitely increases the opportunity for ocean storm waves to come up and over that island in that area, further deteriorate the dunes. But um, I don't see yet the likelihood that an inlet's gonna form in, in the near future. Uh, but again, I just want people to realize that, you know, don't think that that island's gonna be there for lots of more years. It's not gonna go away tomorrow, but it's not gonna be there decades in the future. Okay, I've gotten also a couple of questions um, asking about um, Crescent Beach, which is that area that you mentioned sort of off of Morris Island on the other, um, yeah, one of the sides of the Stage Harbor um, kind of inlet area. Um, and both sort of, if you could talk about um, what you, you, you mentioned that that is an, an area also that has had um, some, it, it's been getting smaller as well. Um, but somebody mentioned right. that there was in the past um, a, a fence off of Crescent Beach um, and just sort of was wondering if you had any um, information on that, whether or not that was something that worked at the time or if it would, if it worked then, but wouldn't work now. You know, I, I've heard about that for years. Um, I've never really seen a good plan, perhaps the Atwood Museum has some good old plans of that that I've never noticed. Um, so I can't really speak to how effective it was in the day and what its real purpose was in the day. The concept, if I understand it, was, I believe, to try to redirect current flow, which is one of the concepts that we are looking at in this current you know, study, whether or not we can install, probably underwater, where exactly, I'm not sure, basically deflection systems, dikes, um, wood structures of some sort to kind of bend the flow away from it. Um, we haven't again focused yet in the study as far as the Crescent Beach erosion itself, whether we would want to target that for, you know, placing some nourishment as sacrificial material. Obviously, you know, it kind of seems counterintuitive to dig sand out of the channel to put to the east so that the system feeds you back into the channel. But anyway, I, I, I wish I had more information if anyone on, on the system here does know more specifics about that dike, I'd, I'd like to see it um, and share it with the engineers. Great. Um, we do have a, a few other questions. It, it is getting to be 6 p.m. Um, so I'm not sure if um... I'm not going anywhere. So it's up to you guys. <laughs> okay. Well, I will. Um... Yeah, we'll take about we'll take a maybe about five more minutes worth of questions, and then uh, Ted, if you want, we can uh, if you're willing, we could uh, uh, send uh, anybody who's interested in asking questions your email. Unless oh, absolutely. You... Okay. I'm we'll... I'm I'm a town employee. I'm here for Excellent. you guys. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I may, I think I'm going to put your email in the chat then because one of these questions sounds like a great question, but is a little long for me to explain <laughs> over this call. Um, so I think um, that I will put in your email so that you two can have, have a discussion about, um, about the different uh -oh. types of sediment. Um, but I will, over, over this, I will, um, I'll ask 
a couple of sort of more general questions. Um, somebody is asking about the potential negative impacts, um, ne negative, sorry, I can't talk, environmental impacts of dredging. And if there are some, and if so, um, what's being done to kind of balance that with obviously the need to have um, Stage Harbor as a, as a safe passage? A very good point. Um, through our permitting process, we have extensive you know, environmental review of the projects that we do, um, primarily to look at the areas where we're dredging, the digging up area, if you will, to see what resources you know, we might be um, impacting. Uh, shellfish is obviously an important one. Eelgrass, which um, we're not impacting whatsoever in these areas. Um, we have time of year windows when you're not supposed to dredge to allow fish passage, horseshoe crab passage, et cetera, that we deal with. And then the same types of issues on where we place the material. Um, fortunately, if you want to consider it such, the material we're digging, particularly now at Stage Harbor, <laughs> is, is so fresh. I mean, it, there's nothing in it. It's beautiful sand. It looks like you just dug it up off the outer beach and, and put it on another beach. Uh, very, very little um, critters in it. The seagulls that usually sit at the outer pipe waiting for morsels have been very disappointed in this because there's nothing in it hardly. But yes, environmental issues are definitely something that we you know, deal with regularly in the permitting process. Um, so in these projects, I think, are done very, very well uh, to minimize those impacts. Um, and there's one more question about how, um, to what extent climate change may have an impact on some of the, you know, obviously it seems like in the last few years, some of these changes have been kind of amping up to a certain degree um, and, and whether or not that's something that's, um, you know, obviously climate change is something that it's hard to do a direct line, you know, cause and effect, but right. if that's something that you've seen impacts from. I mean, climate change, well, how do I want to say this easily? This, the, the changes that we're seeing out there is part of a cycle that has happened before. So we're going through essentially the same or similar, I won't call them the same, um, causes for what's happening. The beach got too long, if you will. It had a new inlet form. The new inlets are breaking up or the beach rather is breaking up and, you know, this would have happened with or without climate change. However, as sea level rises, you know, these, these changes are probably happening more readily um, and, and may not follow the same pattern as they've uh, followed before, both from sea levels being slightly higher in general, but also, and this is an important factor, the mainland has changed. Um, the system on the inside doesn't respond to this in the same way that it did last time. There is more rock revetments that won't let the inside system move as the outside system is trying to move. So that's creating a different scenario in many ways than happened last time. But climate change is you know, a factor and will continue to be a factor. It's just that it is a fairly small increment each year. So it, it's really hard to say that that's causing the acceleration that we see in, in frankly the last few years. Great. Um, well, I think that may be, unless anybody has any other questions, I know that there's one um, in the chat that we didn't quite get to, but that's the one that I think would be best if, uh, if you chatted with Ted on your own about that, just because I think you have a lot of personal knowledge that would be good to share. Um, so unless anybody has any other burning questions, um, thank you again, Ted, so much for, for this wonderful lecture and sharing all those images and videos that really helped to make it real sort of what exactly is going on on our coastline. Yes, thank you very much, Ted. This is great. I'm glad you oh, could. I appreciate uh, it. It was my pleasure. So. Um, I always like to give a shout out to Spencer Kennard, all those pretty aerials, you know, that's because he's sitting out there leaning out of an airplane often in 20 degree weather. So <laughs> sometimes in beautiful weather, but sometimes not so. But anyway, uh, thank you for the opportunity and take care, everybody. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a great evening.